just thank you so much. We, you know, over the course of the last few weeks, we've been trying to have certain chances that you have an online program to get together in person when it works. So um, we'll, we'll continue to be committed to that as we're going on to build community around, not just on Zoom, but face-to-face. -face. So really good to be here. And we'll say about, we'll talk about our research project in a minute, but I think we have some late tricklers. And so maybe it would be really nice if we could quickly go around the room and see who's in the room. I'm gonna start by introducing my special assistant, Anna, who's home from school today. <laughs> and she's gonna be our uh, slide advancer. So Anna's a great help to me all the time. So she's, she's here to help. And I am Pete, I am a professor in the School of Education and just so excited to get to work with this Master's in Sports Leadership Program. It's been um, years in the works and we, it's just been so much fun to do this. And we've got a great group of us all working together. So uh, it's great to be here together. So how about if we, Rochelle, can you tell us who you are? Hello, I'm Rochelle Schneider. I get to work with Pete in Alpha at Leadership and Policy Analysis. I'm a professor over there and I'm so happy to get to come over here. This, this is a treat. It's always part of our, what we've been doing with BIOS is just having people come across different parts of campus. So so many of us spend a lot of our time in that building, just coming over here itself is a cool thing. So I think we have some more alpha people coming in. How about if we go over to uh, Maria, are you up for, are you able to? Yes, I'm Maria Baynard. I uh, work with Pete and BIOS here at Athletic and uh, am a graduate of the alpha program as well. Oh, I'm Emma. And you are a stellar I'm, member of our crew. Yes. <laughs> of our and, and where where are you from, Emma? I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Which is where Anna was born. What where were you where were you uh I'm like where? 45 minutes east of the city. Okay. So like what the, it's what? called North London. Okay, great. Great, great. We live in Mount Lebanon. Okay. My like brother lives there. Nice, nice. I'm Landry, I'm a graduate student in Alpha, and I also work in BIOS. Uh, I'm Justin, I'm also a graduate student in curriculum and instruction, and I help out with BIOS as well. My name is Chris, I'm a student in the uh, sports leadership program. And Chris is the head basketball coach at Oregon High School. Yep. For the boys basketball program. Yep. Yep. No. <laughs> oh, I'm Sarah Jimenez. I am the coordinator of this program. And so it's great to see you all in person. Uh, I'm Miranda. I'm an undergrad studying data science. Um, Miranda's been great coming to some. We, we randomly started talking in the hallway one day, and it's been great to have you joining us. Hi, I'm Michelle Hennings. I'm an instructional designer here on campus, and I work for the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Mentoring. Um, this is Max King. He also works for the Center, and he's joining me today. Uh, we've been assisting on developing the online course, working closely with Sarah and Pete and all their awesome content and media. And so, yeah, you might see my face in the campus course. I'm not an instructor. I'm just um, the lonely tech girl behind the computer screen that helps with the online development part of it. I always really. tell her my Wonder Woman. Yeah, my Wonder Woman. Yeah, so making everything look so great and yeah. the, the 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 kind of theoretical underpinnings of what you do about learning how how we all learn is really great. So thank you. I'm also a um, education grad from UW Madison. Used to teach elementary. And then kind of just worked my way up into higher ed and um, technology. What did you teach? Uh, computer science. Uh, oh, in elementary? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. I got a general like uh, teaching degree. I taught kindergarten. I taught K through five. And then I kind of became like the school technology person. And then I worked for the district um, implementing iPads and Apple oh. MacBooks oh. for all the teachers. And are you by yourself? Great. Cool. She also has ducks. Ducks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Four. Ducks. Four. Well, one. Three. RIP. One. You can tell by a class with me. Oh, goodness. There's three left. Um, so, yeah, if you're lucky, I'll bring some eggs and start to move some. They lay one a day, so you really, <laughs> really got to fight. <laughs> wow. Oh, great. Thank you. 
Bridget. I'm Bridget Woodruff. I work um, in our administration here in the athletics department. I'm Jackie Davenport. Um, I am in a master's in sports leadership program. Uh, I also work in the athletics department here, overseeing our community relations. Jackie's a uh, paper she writes in class always bounced back and forth between like working in athletic administration versus coaching seven-year-olds. Yeah. A good, good, yeah. two good uh, managing teams. Uh, I'm Dan Rohr. I work here in athletics as well in academic services. Awesome. All right. Well, again, thank you all for being here. I wanna, so today we were hoping to do a couple of things. One is just get together, be together, most first and foremost. But then secondly, we have started this um, research project called we call the Wisconsin Coaching Project. And we think that one of the great things of having this master's in sports leadership program here is that we've got a world-class school of education. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's rooted in research, it's empirical foundations of what we do. And so we, we want to not only like offer classes, but to kind of generate new knowledge. And so this study is one of our first efforts in doing that. We're studying coaching throughout Wisconsin and beyond. So as we are, as we have classes, we're teaching and instructing. We're also learning, and we have a great team. So team members who are in the room, raise your hands. Who's who's on the research team? And we have several other. Quentin Smith is is also a PhD student. In the program is joining. Jose Montoya is actually out in New Mexico, but he's still on our team. Uh, Paris Eccles is a PhD student, and he's out of town right now. So we have a great team. All, all everyone has contributed to what we talk about today. I think that's just and Josie, Josie, and she's traveling this weekend she's as well. She's coming back from practice. Yeah. Too. Hey, we got a new participant. You, you have to introduce yourself. If you're going to walk, you're walk in, you have, to, you have to say who you are. <laughs> There's no, uh, no conspicuous entry here. Gerardo is another one who walks in multiple worlds. We're going to talk about the term broker today. He is a different kind of broker, but also more importantly, he's a basketball coach. Yeah. So it's been coaching. We've been walking in similar coaching worlds for many years. Yeah. And so it's great to have you here. Forcing him to be my friend for a lot of years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so th thanks for coming. So we'll, we'll share some of our initial findings this team has had. So what we've been doing is every week in this down of our little lab downstairs, we meet. We've been interviewing lots of coaches from around the state. Um, we had a really interesting tech. I want to talk a little bit about the method we use, which has been a kind of a cool method. We've used kind of like a snowball sampling method where we, we found these coaches throughout the state who are like these exemplar people who have certain kind of things that like values and principles that we like really admire and we're looking for in our coaches that we develop, like commitment to like the holistic person that you're coaching, not just win, winning games, but coaching. Commitment to holistic develop, development, um, commitment to um, kind of wellness, to making sure that that not only do we help kids um, learn how to be better softball players or gymnasts, but that they're healthy of mind and, and body for the for the long haul. So we have a series of criteria like that, and so we went to a lot of these coaches, and we've been going around the state. You may have seen some of these things where we go around and we give these awards. It's a it's a, a cowbell. And there's a, there's a story behind that as well. I'll, I'll briefly tell it, which is that the, the, the metaphor is that if you know anything about cows, anybody grew up on like a dairy farm or anything in here? Anybody? No? Okay, good, because I'll blast the story. Which is that, you know, back in the old days, like cows are these super social animals and that farmers would put a bell around the neck of like the lead cow that the other cows would naturally follow them. So if, if these huge spaces, you know, many, many, many hundreds of acres, they're trying to find the cows, they can just listen for the bell and they'd know they could find the whole herd if they found the, uh, they heard the, the, the bell because they're all following that cow. So there's, there's an aspect of that that's like a leadership metaphor, which is that there are certain kind of leaders, it's a natural thing that um, if, that people gravitate toward them and people follow them. So we have gone to try to identify some of these kind of natural leaders in our state, people who have embodied these things and we've been giving them these awards, going to the schools. It's been a really cool thing to see how meaningful and how like influential these people are in their schools that they impact many lives. Um, the first one we gave was to Coach Larson, Coach Bruce Larson up at Somerset High School outside the Twin Cities. And that was November 11th, 
uh, last year. It was so our first um, bell cow award. And then tragically, Coach Larson passed away just like a month after that. And one of the things that was, first of all, so cool was that when we did the bell cow uh, ceremony for him in the gym that day at Somerset High School, the entire school community was there. A local, uh, local members of local veteran, military veterans were there because he was really, he built his program around um, army values, like integrity, courage, and these values. So he brought in the entire military community as well. And so on that day, we gave him this. Um, the whole community was there. We could visually see the impact he had. And then when he passed away a couple months later, that same community came together again. And I actually got a number of notes about this and how it was kind of like this really cool thing for him and his family at the end of his, that he didn't know it, but it was like one of their last great memories together. So um, the only reason I share that story is that it's a story of the impact of a great coach and the impact of a great leader and what they can have. So we went to a lot of these coaches and we asked them about the criteria and we started getting ref more ref references, references. We started vetting people. We got hundreds of coaches that we heard about. And we've been from that sample, we created like a, a, a sample that we're studying with those people, what they do, how do they do it? And that's the Wisconsin Coaching Project. So we'll take that work we're finding and we'll infuse that into what we're teaching in our courses. We'll continue to develop with what we're learning. Um, and that's great. We'll go and share it throughout the state. Our aim is not only to uh, help the people who come into our program become great coaches. Hey, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Great to have you here. Um, it's it's not only for those in our in our program, but we want to influence all coaching throughout the state. So whether it's seven year olds in uh, what's your town there, huh? The forest. Whether it's seven year olds in the forest or high schoolers in Oregon or wherever we are, that that we want to like to have an impact on the field of coaching. So share a couple of the results. I'm going to kind of frame it, and then our team members are going to get up and tell a couple stories that we've learned. And this is an ongoing, early on thing so far. So Anna. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so our focus, I, I did, I, my re remote wasn't working, but even better than remote. Um, our focus has been on this stuff. We've read a lot in our program about social capital, you know, about what it is. And this is one definition. There are many, many books about it. I, I kind of passed some of these around. You can just glance if you want to just take a glance at what someone is kind of, not that you're dying to look through that kind of stuff on a Friday afternoon, but. It gives you a sense for the literature we're basing that in. And what social capital says, it's like the features of a social organization such as networks, norms and trust that facilitate coordination and cooperation for mutual benefit. That's a lot of language. Next, next slide, Anna. Um, <laughs> but the, if you read this literature a lot, one of the things that we know from that literature from, from James Coleman, from Nan Lin, who's one of the people that we use a lot, is that social capital undergirds human capital. Like what we can do as people is very much rooted in our relationship networks and who we know and how they support us and how we mutually uh, gain support. Um, so the way that we're studying social capital is through this language of brokerage, organizational brokerage, meaning that like to broker is to connect. That, so that not, not brokerage in the way that Gerardo does it, although you are a master connector in so many ways, but the, the term that we're looking at is how do, how do connections happen um, on teams and through sport? I'm gonna talk about that next slide. This gets a little more like academic-y or theoretical, but the top one is how many of us often think of this is like individual brokerage, meaning that like, since I know Maria, Maria connects me to Emma, Maria has brokered my relationship between me and Emma. Now I know Emma. And that's like the term we often hear, like it's not, it's not what you know, but who you know. If you know a bunch of people, you can get connected to a lot of things. We're that's that's important, but we're thinking a little more about this bottom part, which is like if the circle is a person, it it's not just the matter of that circle person knowing another person to get connected. It's, it's like the rectangle is the organization. Okay, if, you, if you're a part of a certain organization, what kind of benefits do you get? So if the, if the rectangle is the team, by nature of being in that rectangle on the team, what do you get connected to? And, and we know from our research so far that one of, the key, one of the key aspects of that is the leader. The leader kind of shapes 
what happens inside that rectangle in many ways. So we're really looking at how this idea of organizational brokerage. So it's not just what I do as the leader, it's what kind of an organization I help design. So if I can design an organization that values voice, recognizes people from on all, all people who come in, in different ways, allows people to um, thrive with who they are and their own identity, um, all that kind of thing, then that's, that's an organization that connects. It's not just me connecting. All right, so that's what we're looking at. These are two of the questions that we're asking. The first one's kind of clunky wording word. Tinker aim at that. By being part of this team, what do I get connected to? Very basic thing. So obviously we hope you get connected to like really great coach, nice person, you know, smart coach, good teammates. But we also hope you get connected to certain like ways of, you know, ways of thinking, um, orientations about how to be a person who contributes to a just society and to making things better, not just on your team, but beyond. We hope you get connected to like good strategies for what you're doing. So it's not just like I get connected to Justin, it's I get connected to this range of things. So that's what we're asking about. And then we want to specifically know about how coaches do it. All right. So we're going to do that. We're, at, we're working through this and we got a bunch of ways, but we're talking about connected. How do coaches foster connection? All right. And we're going to have some of our team members get up and share a couple stories and we'll kind of talk it through. And we're open to like talking this through. So who has been, who has been Landry? Um, so again, we've all been working on this together, but we've, we had, we took some, volunteers to do so so there's one coach these are all pseudonyms and one thing that we really were honing in on with ben was the idea of um intentional challenging what can you talk to us about ben a little bit landry yeah stand up i guess um, so ben is a coach in texas he's a baseball coach spent for over 20 years uh played division one college baseball was in the hall of fame in this call and broke a bunch of records and over his 20 years of experience in playing, he's gained this expertise of sort of identifying in, like intentional challenges for his team. And he's sort of identified three objectives that he explains to his team. And that's how he defines their team success. And that's if they run the bases, if they throw strikes, and if they make routine plays, then win or lose on the scoreboard that they were successful that day. And when he's talking about these different aspects of intentional challenging, like he'll go during practices and physically go ground balls with the players and show them how the right way to do it or throw strikes or run the bases. And a great story that he talked about during the interview was a time where they had a baseball game that was tied. It was right before the playoffs and they didn't want to waste pitchers. So he talked to the other coach and he said, well, we're going to race each other to see who wins the game. And he ended up racing the other coach to win the game. So he, he not only shows in practice, but in the game, he ran the bases and that's how they ended up winning the game. And that was just a really good example of intentional challenging and how to find success in his team. Thank you, Landry. And, and, and I, as we had talked about in that story, it was like, you know, the word connection can be a kind of like a uh, very ambiguous term. Like, what does that mean to be connected? And, and it was so interesting with that, that story and with others that it was like, they had these very specific like tasks that they were working on that he, he believed that those things would, like they would help them be better baseball players but they were connecting with each other in how they did it. Like, it wasn't just that he told them, go do these things. He did it with them. He, um, and, and they regularly had discussions about them around these like specific tasks. So that's really, thank you for that example. All right, so that's Ben. Now, how about Andrew, this idea of em informed empathy? That's Justin. Well, for the Zoom people can see. I'll be front Andrew, you have to <laughs> Do it again. Yeah, so Andrew is a, uh, uh, under his pseudonym, uh, he is a uh, basketball coach in the area. Um, and he had a bit of a tough upbringing, uh, kind of a rough childhood uh, home that um, that he could relate with his, uh, his uh, kids now as a uh, coach now. Um, he, he works as a uh, police officer in the uh, community as well. So he's a coach at the local high school where he works with uh, high school students uh, during the day. And then uh, during his uh, real, uh, his other uh, job as a police officer, he works directly within the community. 
And there's been um, several occasions where uh, they'll get a call about uh, maybe a domestic violence issue or a domestic uh, problem going in at somebody's house and he'll he'll recognize the names on the call as um, as names that are associated with his uh, high school team. And he he always wants to be the one to uh, knock on their doors because for one, he relates with uh, their he relates with these athletes within a school setting, but also he has um, a background of kind of growing up in a tough uh, tough home where he has uh, uh, his own form of informed empathy and his own ways that he can relate to these uh, athletes whether it's directly at home uh, where there could be issues going on or even uh, issues that could be going on um, at, at school. So he kind of takes a dual, um, dual approach of uh, being uh, understanding of his uh, athletes and really being able to connect with uh, athletes that, um, can be, uh, that can be difficult to find in a lot of settings. So his is unique where he, uh, he has his role as a coach and his role as a police officer to um, connect with uh, athletes at school and within the community. So he, he does a really great job and uh, he's a great person to be a part of our study. Thank you, Justin. And we, so we've been taking these micro stories and lumping them into like these bigger themes. So these two both fell into this theme that we're coming across as um, shared experience. So one of the ways that we're finding that a lot of the leaders, the many leaders we're interviewing are building connective, connective um, cultures is through shared experience by whether it's sharing something that, that, that happened to both of them, um, sharing an experience outside of the team or sharing an experience around like running the bases, literally something that simple. So we're building out that theme a lot. All right, so let's hear about Denise, with this theme of vulnerability. Yes, so along the same lines that he had shared in terms of shared experience, one of the things that we're finding with um, within the project is that not only coaches connect well um, by going through like some of this, like the same things, but also by being vulnerable. Uh, so we had one coach, uh, Denise, and Denise um, is a volleyball coach uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Denise, had a player that uh, she just was like, kind of started to be keenly aware of just due to uh, weight loss. So this player came in um, at a high competitive level and just started losing weight. Uh, from the time this player was a freshman all the way through the time this player uh, was a senior, uh, by the end of her, or by her senior year, she was not allowed to play. It was kind of a hard line drawn in the sand. She had lost too much weight. It was one of the things too, where Denise um, was keenly aware. So one of the uh, characteristics of her was she was just very mindful, observant, and cautious too about the way she approached the situation because it's a sensitive topic. Um, it, not only for uh, people who are female and also, or female athletes, but just being a female as well. Um, but one of the things too is, so this player was not allowed to play her senior year, um, just due to, I don't know, sensitivity around, around, around all of this. Um, the, this parent's players wanted to sue this coach. Um, they were meeting with the athletic director. It was a very high tense situation, um, but this coach decided to approach the situation and be vulnerable with this player, with this team, and share her own experiences with weight loss. And not only that, but just being a female as well and coaching females. So she took this idea of, opening herself up and being vulnerable to the situation. And it caused a, it caused the whole team to just kind of rally around both of them. So it wasn't that she just like felt like she had to open up her deepest, darkest, deepest, darkest secrets as being a coach, but it was more being aware of a certain situation and using her own experiences and then opening up about them in order to connect and help this player live. And to this day, that's uh, one of her most powerful stories that she shared was that um, it's, it's, fun to see this person alive as a mother now with two kids, um, even though she was at the point of death close to, in her career. Um, and she said not only that, but the players around her not only rallied around this player, but they also rallied around the coach. 
and I was able to form a lot of great connections there. So this idea of vulnerability along with shared experience is another thing that we are finding. And that was like such a high integrity move by her because she was she herself was vulnerable because she was sitting one of the stars of the team, right? Mm -hmm. Not allowing her to play because she saw the greater benefit for that for that young woman. So great story. How about Jen and the idea of bringing her whole self to the to the coaching? Sure, hi Jen. Um, Janet is a soccer coach for a youth program in Wisconsin, and what stands out for me is, is, is her authentic, authenticity and her vulnerability as well. Um, she's an example of someone who brings her whole self to the club, and that what I mean by that is she shares her multiple identities with, with her players, and she invites her players to, to share their multiple identities on the team as well. Um, Jen is a coach. She's a mom, a wife, a sister, a daughter, all of those things. And she shares all of that with her team. Um, she played sports her whole life. And one thing that stood out for me is that it wasn't until she was in her mid twenties that she had a female coach. So she had male coaches her whole life. And, the, but when she talks about her female coach, her um, name coach Sydney, she said, and this is a quote by her, she said, I was able to watch her be vulnerable and she was learning while she was helping us learn. She was the first person to tell us when she was making a mistake. So all of a sudden my appreciation for female coaches within the game quickly grew. And what's really great about Jen is as a result of that in the club, it's a youth club that has ranges, um, young kids all the way up through high school, uh, boys and girls on every single team there's a woman coach, like in some capacity. And she really, really believes strongly in that um, to bring multiple perspectives to the, to the club. Um, another way that she brings her whole, whole self to the program is she brings her two-year-old, she just had a, her second baby. Um, I interviewed her about a week after her son was born, but she brings her two-year-old daughter to, the pra to every practice, to every game. Her two-year-old daughter sits on the bench and really models what it means to be a coach, a mom, and I think the girls see, she's, you know, she really appreciates that the girls see her as a mom and she finds it very valuable for her daughter to be like engulfed in that situation as well. Um, another thing about Jen is not only is she um, vulnerable and authentic, but she gives her players an opportunity to bring their whole selves to the practices. So she has, um, what she said is the girls, they can self-express. They can come and talk to me if there's something going on. And just always remembering to put the person first because I am hoping that I can pos positively impact them to be just be good, strong females when they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever that looks like. So I thought that was really powerful. And finally, this kind of falls in our routines, shared experiences, but Jen does this thing called tea time. And so every day at the beginning of practice, she invites her girls to just let off steam and share their tea is what she says. So what that means is they can, they, they, she says she hides, she hides some exercise in this, but they basically maybe go back up and down the field, kicking the ball to each other, throwing the ball to each other, but they're talking about their day. They're talking about what happened at school, what happened at home, what happened with their friends. They get that all out. And she, she engages it too. She's running down the field with them and kicking the ball around. Um, but they get that all out. So the girls feel like they can, they have a safe place to come to practice. They can, rather than, you know how sometimes, I don't know, athletes, if you've gone to practice and you have all this on your mind, you've got to study for this exam, right? all this stuff going on. And you don't, you, you, it just like, it's just like you're carrying it while you're trying to do practice, right? So this way they get it out. They, and then when, then when it's time to practice, they're practicing. And I think she that she just finds that very, very valuable. It's a way to connect. She gets to do the same thing because she's coming to practice with having a long day. And so it works really well. So that's just an ex a couple of examples how I think Jen is really authentic. And I'm just so excited that she's part of the study. And some of this, like last, last, uh, our first, this is our second sharing of the study. And last time we really did kind of the research foundations of it. And one of the things we talked about there was this, this kind of thing that's been happening in American society the last 30 years, which is a couple of these authors have written about, which is the disappearing of kind of social capital institutions in America. And that if you look at like surveys of where people spent their time from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 
it's changed a lot of it. A lot of, you know, a lot of it is because of, you know, we can communicate on social media or uh, we can take in entertainment this way. But there's also this huge decrease in like what we call the organized life in America, meaning that, you know, there's not the thriving churches or the civic organizations or even school organizations like school sports. We've seen a flocking out of school sports where people's most important sports, a lot of us in this room know, like a lot of kids' most important sports is now happening not on the school team, but on a club team or another team. And every time that happens, like there's this pulling away from organizations. And so the things that Sarah just said about like a space where these these are young girls or the thing you shared, Maria, about um, young women going through certain things, like it's not just that those are important conversations, but it's that there are fewer and fewer places to have them in a caring kind of context. And so that some of this stuff, that, that's a great example of not only is she doing a great thing for her kids, but she's doing it in a context where there are fewer spaces to do that. And that just kind of amplifies the importance of the work of coaching, because we do know that like participation is going down in a lot of these other places we talked about, but it's not going down in club soccer or in club basketball or in hockey. We were talking about hockey the other day or all these areas like it's ramping up so we can tap into some of those networks in much smarter and better ways. The last one, I'll, I, this one comes with, so we're talking about Penny here. I, I, and I always do because every time I use a, like a name for something, I always use the name Kenny for some reason. So I, <laughs> I said I'll use it. Uh, so Kenny um, is a story in like the nuance to a lot of this, because first of all, we don't want to present any of these coaches. We're, we're finding flawed people. Like these are not perfect coaches. A every one of them, like, you know, not everyone, but a lot of them will say things were like, really, you know, really? Like, <laughs> doesn't seem quite right. Or th these are not like perfect. They're, they're flawed and everything. And then with each of these things we're talking about, none of them are like clean and simple, black and white. There, there's a little gray area. And one of them that he talked about was what we call this idea of like contextual disclosure, meaning, you know, we've talked about vulnerability, about empathy, but these coaches have all played with like, well, how much of myself do I show? Like the role of a coach here is not part, you're part psychologist, psychiatrist, teacher, parent, friend. There's some of all of that, but the role of the coach is not just come in and dump everything on your team and to like say everything is wrong with your life. And like that is not, there's a line there that they're, we're trying to figure out. Um, so Kenny had this, when he talked about it in an interesting way about like, he said, I'm not their peer. Like I'm not their, he said, I'm not their friend. I am their coach. And so with, with being coach comes some authority and it, it does come like there's this separation. It's not, there is a separation of being a leader by, by the positional authority that you have, but that he had a nice way of kind of figuring that out with like figuring out what to disclose, what not to disclose, not only about himself, but the term that has come up in some of the work is the term buffer. That sometimes a coach needs to be a buffer to the team, meaning like there are some things that they shouldn't know and they it would be hurtful for them to know. And so knowing that you're not just an open sieve of information, sometimes the coach is the buffer. We had an interesting, we've been having these conversations with Sidney Moncrief, who was a great NBA player over the years, and he's helping us with this class. And it's been really cool to learn from him. And uh, it just, I was talking to him last week about this term, this idea, and he said that was one of the most important things he thought was, increasingly especially when information is everywhere and it's just like you can't it's hard to protect yourself from what's out there that there is still a role of a coach as being someone who there's a protective factor that sometimes my my role is to like create kind of like a safe safer place to be so this has all been really interesting again these are just some like really initial things um and we're our next steps are we're going to keep uh we've got a couple other big categories we're developing through we're parsing it all out. We have meetings every week. Um, we're aiming toward writing about it. We're going to publish some journals about it, journal articles about it. We're going to present it at some conferences, and we're going to keep building our courses off of it. But I want to ask you uh, briefly. So our schedules, we got time for a little, you know, exchange. If you guys think we're way off base, let us know. We're we're here to discuss. Um, if you have questions about how we're doing it, we can do that. And then also we have. Lots of food, and also we can do a little tour of some stuff. What do you think? Any questions about anything we said, or anything you have seen? The jives with what you've seen, or or not? 
I may even, I'm going to start. I, I, I'm sorry, while you're thinking about it, you didn't know. And I'm going to put Gerardo on the spot a little because I, I, a lot of this, like I have, you know, like we had those years ago when we were, we were coaching like little guys, yeah. you know, and, and some of this is like the wisdom of now being old, you know, right. of looking back. And that I remember we, we've encountered these characters over the years. You, know, you see the whole continuum of coaches, good, bad, horrible, but also like, you know, parents who are different ways, good and bad. Like, have you observed like over the years, like really people are really good at this stuff connecting and what have you seen in like the youth basketball world? Um, so to me, you know, coaching for me has changed drastically from when I first started in this program. Coach, coaching used to be a cause and effect type thing where it was like, if you didn't do something, it was a negative effect to it. And that was a, a way, a standard way of how all coaching would approach. You know, you didn't need a certain time, it was punishment. If you didn't play a certain way, it was a punishment. Um, and so from my experience from being involved with, with the youth program, you know, when I first came into it um, on my own level, that was what I adhered to. And that's what I started with, was this idea of if the result wasn't what I expected, there was a negative you know, a negative repercussion to it. Uh, and, you know, as things have evolved and I continue to stay involved in new programs, I just was never getting the results that I was hoping to get out of my athletes and uh, the uh, athletes that participate in the program. So I, I started to kind of trying to study and learn how to best motivate. You know, and, and, you know what I took as motivation for me 20, 30 years ago is not what's motivating for you these days. And it's the factors are different, what the parents' expectations are different. So trying to find the balance of that is what we, we as a youth program continue to try to do. You know? So now when I talk to the coaches that I work with and everything else, it's really a process of trying to figure out what's the motivating factor for these kids, what empowers them, what makes them want to do better, mm -hmm. be better, what makes them want to come on a consistent basis to practice, what makes them want to give their 100 percent effort. And then after that, trying to get the parents on board because of seeing the positive results that come from it. So it's, that, that, I mean, that, for me, it's a night and day thing before because now I'm actually trying to listen to the athletes to see where, what are the buttons that triggers them to do things in a positive way, you know? And then how can I turn something that I feel like is a negative consequence into a motivational factor? So it's just that constant thinking all the time. Mm -hmm. you know? It hits on a thing that we, we've talked about in uh, class, which is like, why do kids ever first go to, you know, the, to go row or to go to a hockey rink or go, they go there because they love like the game and they love their friends, like relationships and the joy of the game. Right. And so like, but then we all of a sudden so often, you know, we beat that out of them. Like we, we strip away the, the relationships that are so meaningful or the love of the game, the joy of the game. We don't value that so i think that that really relates anyone else what, what else dan is with budding young athletes you know what do you what do you think uh sorry i'm just i'm like a law professor here picking on people what, what comes up for me is um these are very applicable to a work team mm -hmm. that um very, very intentional or important on an athletic team or a sports team. But if I if I think about in my previous role having a team that is leading, all five of these things are incredibly important. So what I love is if coaches are learning that and instilling that into their athletes, if they can learn that and take that with them into life, they will be leading teams all their life. So that's what um what I love where this stuff comes up. Yeah. Yeah, it helps for sports. Too. I mean, like it helps you win games, but then it's like you take it with you after yeah, you absolutely like if i show up vulnerable with my staff you know that's going to build a connection where and show that uh, if i have informed the empathy of connecting with them right or um challenge intentionally challenging yeah. them if i know that there's areas they have strengths in well i may intentionally challenge them in that um that strength or that weakness area so um just really interesting that apply it outside of the world of sports there's this quote I heard yesterday it's, it's a, by the duke of wellington it says there's nothing except the battle lost can be half so melancholy as a battle won. Nothing, say it again. <laughs> nothing except the battle lost can be half so melancholy as a battle won. And I think like, I, I think sometimes our short 
like the way we shortchange sport or anything like that, aiming only at one little outcome and we walk away from it like, was that it? Like, is that all there was? And by doing these things, like looking at these bigger things, the relationships, the leadership that we can foster, you know, because that's true. Like you can, you can win the national championship in your sport. I saw you walk in to the corner of my eye. <laughs> that's all you got coming out of it. Like, that's cool, but that's, that's, we're missing a whole lot. So, so that's, uh, I think that's a big point. One, I was going to just share one of the things that we've had conversations with just through like our literature reviews and through just like our deductive and uh, analysis is, is there a difference between being authentic and being vulnerable and what those differences look like? And we, I think through, through the case study of the people that we've interviewed and the coaches that we've come to learn from that being your authentic self and being vulnerable are different things that they're not necessarily the same. So that's one of the things that we've been trying to distinguish is how do good coaches be authentic and be vulnerable vulnerable and are they the same things I don't know if anybody else wants to share to like the conversations we've had but yeah um, well and some of that was that like I like we've, we've had we had a couple of coaches we talked about who were like they were old school like and they were we had some they're like you know they're like arrogant loud like yellers but they were actually really good at this stuff like yeah. that's what they were that their personality was like big personalities they weren't the one who was going to sit down and do the stuff that Sarah was talking about. but what they were so they were authentically themselves they, they were kind of like the way that they were but they also it didn't mean that they didn't create space the idea of an organization that had vulner, had vulnerability to it so they mm -hmm. they were they were self-aware enough to know that like there's no way that Anna is going to come to me with this because I'm too scary like but I have three other staff members who I can like balance and she's going to have a go-to person. So that's a perfect example of like, I'm not trying to be someone I'm not uh -huh. because we, we're all very different. And some of, and it doesn't mean just because you're that gruff, tough yeller that you can't be vulnerable. You can't create space in your organization for vulnerability and connection. That's more than you. It can't be just you, but if it's just you, then it's not, it's not sustainable. That's a good, good point. Thank you. Sorry you missed all the you know, brilliant earth-shattering findings, but it's good to have you here. Good to, tell, tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Erin, and I'm on the soccer team. I'm Lily. I'm also on the soccer team. And they're members of the Masters in Sports Leadership Program, yep, who bring great perspective, great le leadership. So it's good to have you both here. You gotta get you. your t-shirts before you come. Jacob, oh, Jacob, you didn't introduce yourself yet. I'm oh. sorry, you, I saw you when you came in, Jacob, but I didn't realize you introduced you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jake. I'm in the Master of Sports Leadership and I'm on the track team. And you were at part one as well, part one of our findings. So, well, great. Well, thank you all. Um, more to come. We're gonna keep doing these. Great to have you here. We, we have all kinds of food and we're going to do a couple things. We're gonna do a little walkabout with anyone who wants to do it, see some stuff. We can come. We can come back here, circle back here. But it'd be great if we get. Does anybody who wants to do this? Who wants to go on a little walk around? Anybody coming? Well, okay. Can we get a photo? Let's get a photo. A pre a photo now, just in case we lose people. We get a photo of the group. We want to get everybody in it. Thank you to everybody and online. Have a good coming. day. We want to get a photo.